Hey everyone, Chris Earl here again with another Geog 217 lecture. I hope everyone's been doing well and I hope you're ready for lecture 3B. So today's lecture is on issues of aging and different age cohorts in the city, how people from different age groups experience the city and the different challenges that we face, especially as we get older. But there's some issues of youth in here as well. So when we talk about aging in the city, we need to understand who we're actually sharing the city with. In today's cities, we're generally living amongst members of about seven different demographic cohorts. Generally, in cities in North America, these are the greatest generation. These are folks that were born from 1901 to 1927. Then the silent generation. These are folks who were born from 1928 to about 1945. Then we have the boomers. These are people born from 1946 to 1964. Gen X from 1965 until about 1979. Also millennials between 1980 and 1996. Gen Z from 1997 up until about 2012. And the newest generation, the one that actually doesn't have an end date, Generation Alpha from about 2013 onward. Consider how broad these categorizations are. The youngest member of the greatest generation is now 93. These are folks who fought in the Second World War and in many cases lived through the Great Depression. The youngest of the silent generation is now 75. The youngest boomer is only 56. Conversely, the oldest millennial is 40. Age doesn't really define the entirety of our identity. And of course, I'm gonna get everyone to remember back to our lecture on forming an identity in the urban environment and how a wide variety of factors come to influence our identities. But when we're considering the basics of our cities, like what kinds of housing there is in the city, what kinds of amenities cities have, and how transportation networks are structured, we have to understand that people from different generations will have different wants and needs based on both the identity that they have forged over time and their differing mobility needs. See, one thing we haven't discussed enough of in this class is the experience of people with differing physical and cognitive abilities in the city. Of course, a discussion about context of aging should help prime your minds and prepare you to study issues of disability in the city at a later point. There are entire courses that should just be dedicated to that, considering the way that cities are formed and shaped can severely impact the livelihoods of individuals who have differing physical and mental abilities. As we age, people's cognitive and physical abilities change. Such is the nature of being human, unfortunately. Our bodies are not meant to last forever. That's why I'm banking on technology that'll let me upload my brain to a computer. But at this point, I'd really just settle for anything that would help with hair growth. Regardless, as it becomes harder and harder for people to move around, and as their mental faculties change, they need differing urban environments to help them better function as people. Conversely, when people are young, mobile, and sharp, they want spaces that cater to them, and they're often okay with enduring more physically challenging or confusing urban places. Consider some of the housing situations in cities that you've all experienced and how okay it is for you, and then put yourself into the perspective of maybe your grandparents or other older people that you know. Age segregation in cities isn't just based on our needs and our desires. It's also based on the way we've structured our entire society. Age segregation can be, as geographers often like to note, both a spatial and temporal phenomenon. This is in large part because of how we spend our days, normally, you know, when we're not locked down. At home, on any given day, we're generally around people who are within a few different age cohorts of us, generally not too many. And if it's just you or your roommates or you and a partner, you're gonna be surrounded by people who are most likely of the same generation. When we take public transit, we are surrounded by people commuting for the same reasons. So again, they're likely around us in age. And then of course, we're going to workplaces or to other places where we're going to generally be around people, again, in our same age cohorts. The places we go for our social activities will generally be places where we similarly interact with folks who are close to our age. And when we're in school, our day is filled with interactions between people who are exactly the same age cohort as us. And when we retire, 
we're in the same position. So the way that we experience the city can be impacted by our age. Our day-to-day -day lives may have us very isolated from people of differing generations. And then, of course, we're isolated from the different wants and the different needs and the different ideas they have about the city and how it should actually function. In terms of age and urban structure, I've previously mentioned that there are three different areas of focus for us when we're considering these things. That's housing, amenities, and transportation. So let's start with housing. Researchers considering the issue of aging in the city have noted that one thing that always seems to get people, one thing that always seems to influence folks, is that old human foe on which we so readily rely. Habit. Consider the age groups we share the city with. And now look at the urbanization trends here in Canada. When we look at the time periods in which each generation grew up, we can begin to understand why some folks are more eager to live in certain areas. The silent generation and boomers came up at a time of increasing suburbanization. There was a slow shift from rural to suburban at that time, thanks to, if you'll remember back to our lecture on labor in the city, the post-war compromise. Many members of those generations had family members from the greatest generation who had fought in the Second World War and came home to a Canada that was hammering out the details of this post-war compromise. They had easy access to cars low slung suburban housing developments, and an urban form that was very much so focused on the individual family. Gen X and millennials were raised by members of these generations in different iterations of the suburbs. It's the common belief that in many cases, we rebelled against these environments, which we saw as sterile, simple, and outdated. Such frustrations can be seen in the cultural works that some of you are analyzing for your final project, like the plastic nature of the suburbs in Tim Burton's Edward Scissorhands, or in the subtle darkness of the Arcade Fire music video for the suburbs that I showed at the introduction of the project. Those who assert that we despise the urban environment in which we lived, sought out an urban environment that was more reflective of our lifestyles, say that Gen Xers and we millennials have moved back into cities and subsequently gentrified them. And so Gen Z and Generation Alpha are finding themselves raised by people of these generations in more and more urban environments. But research indicates that the housing choices of our parents actually have a stronger pull on us than we expected. Marjolein Blaubauer from the University of Amsterdam studied the housing choices of people in the Netherlands and found that the urban environments and the housing situations that we lived in as children had a significant and substantial impact on the kinds of housing we would seek out as adults. Opet et al. similarly found that among millennials, past housing experience has a major pull on us. But thanks to our exposure to smaller and smaller housing in more and more dense urban areas, we're being acclimatized to urban life. So rather than reject the houses of our parents as a kind of rebellion, we're highly influenced by the homes we grew up in and only because of how the urban form has changed are we accepting different kinds of accommodation. But as we get older, our housing needs change considerably. As Fonod et al. wrote, when older people, particularly those 65 and over, experience things that to young people may seem irrelevant, like a fall, it can seriously impact and harm them. They note that over one third of individuals over 65 will suffer a fall in their home at some point. And if one becomes fearful or unable to move around, even in their own home, they can feel trapped by their housing situation and limited in their freedom as to how they wanna act. As such, many people will opt to sell their homes and move into retirement communities. Retirement communities are a very interesting aspect of the urban landscape. They are institutional facilities, like hospitals, but are places where residents could live for decades. These facilities will charge rent, or are offered to people as condos, or charge other fees associated with the extra services and amenities that are provided to people who live there. Some aim to bring as many components of the city as close to residents as possible. In certain gated communities that are focused on a retirement clientele, they provide seniors with a level of independence. They'll have stores and pharmacies and doctor's offices and other services that are close enough to allow the elderly to get to them quickly. That offers them the freedom that they had in their youth, but augmented to their new reality. Still other retirement communities are self-contained within single buildings. 
If you want to add in the other authors of the 2019 study that I'll reference at the end, they interviewed residents at one Stockholm retirement home to ask them about what drove them into this place and what their experiences were like. The residents discussed how they lost their freedom in their normal homes, but they regained a sense of independence and community, especially community amongst members of their peer group, of their cohort. The respondents similarly talked about how important it was for them to retain some of the things that they had done in their previous homes, or to maintain a sense of habit and the sense of community that they once had, while changing the nature of their housing and how they experienced the urban environment to meet their new needs. This study, and many studies considering how older adults experience the urban environment, place an emphasis on community. When one feels trapped in their home or unable to move with speed or ease, it can limit their connections to others in the city, making them feel isolated and alone despite the fact that they are surrounded by people. Retirement homes can help foster community and connections and allow for people to maintain those connections that they had while providing an extra level of support around them. By simply changing where they live, seniors can come to strengthen the bonds they had with their community and still be able to experience what they did in the larger urban environment when they were younger. So that was housing. But housing and amenities are strongly linked. Amenities play a very strong role in helping us decide what kind of urban environments we want to settle in and can influence and impact how we experience our communities. The proximity of one's home to different amenities can dissuade us from seeking out a rural life. And here we'll shift away from seniors and toward younger folks. Consider younger families. Young families have a wide array of needs, childcare and doctors to recreation facilities and proximity to support networks. Need for these kinds of things have pushed some families to consider the suburbs over urban or rural settings. Choices like this can become cyclical. Families will see a daycare or a family doctor or a big open park in a neighborhood and decide to move there. Businesses and recreation planners will see an influx of families to a particular area and begin to cite more daycares and family doctors' offices and playgrounds there. And then the cycle continues. But for a great many years, large urban centers were seen as inherently unfriendly to families. Perceptions around the inhospitability of urban centers led families to the suburbs or to cities that were built around suburban development. This is referenced in things like the 2019 Movinga study from Germany that looked at 150 metropolitan areas around the world and ranked them from best to worst in terms of the family experience. Calgary was listed as the eighth best city in the world for families after Reykjavik. Ottawa was 14th. Toronto and Vancouver were 34th and 35th respectively. Cities that were built around a more suburban development style got higher marks and were seen as better for families. Similarly, amenities can be cause for concern based on social perceptions about the age cohorts that frequent them. So an interesting amenity with a very interesting history is skateboard parks. When skateboard parks are proposed by local planners and officials who are responding from pressure, usually from local youth and individuals in the community who want to see these sorts of things cited there, they can face incredible backlash from other members of the community who are worried about crime, assault, and other deviant behaviors occurring in their backyards because of these parks. Skateboarding has a reputation as something done by wayward youth. Bad kids who smoke and drink and do drugs and listen to big old scary music. As such, people from older generations, generally people who are from the silent or boomer generations, or a few Gen Xers, the less cool ones, who own property and live in these areas, are worried about what kind of other bad behaviors and groups that are focused on those deviant behaviors will come along with the young people that are attracted to skateboard parks. To counter these negative perceptions, the Tony Hawk Foundation commissioned a study of crime and deviance in skate parks. The foundation had partnered with a number of communities to build a whole bunch of new skate parks for local residents. And in 2009, they studied those communities. What they found upended all the conventional arguments about skate parks. 90% of police officers interviewed in the communities that had built skate parks identified the parks as actually being beneficial to helping their jobs. 91% said there were no issues at all of crime or deviance in those parks. 
and a full 47% actually said there was a marked decrease in youth crime since the parks opened. Why might this be? Well, police officers said it was beneficial to centralize youth into one main place. And the biggest community concern was often people loitering around or youth with nothing else to do. So providing youth with an outlet for their energy and something to keep them occupied, a challenge, gave them meaning, purpose, and moved them away from deviant behaviors or crimes. Another reason could be, going back to Jane Jacobs, eyes on the street. With youth around, skating and participating in the active life of their communities, they were watching what was happening. You're not likely to break into a car if you see 20 to 30 skateboarding youths in the park across the street. The elderly have amenities that are very different from youth though. They're usually not at skateboard parks, although there are some exceptions. As was noted in the discussion about housing, many older folks need amenities far closer to where they live, as they may be in situations of limited mobility, may have difficulty driving, or may have cognitive impairments that severely impact their ability to function in a wide array of unfamiliar places. This leads us to transportation. People of differing ages have differing transportation needs. As people get older, their transportation needs will change rather dramatically. It becomes more and more difficult for people to get around as their physical and mental states change with age. Many cities have dedicated public transit systems just for the elderly and people with disabilities, or they'll offer reduced or free public transportation for people over a certain age, aware that driving just isn't a feasible option for many older people. But encouraging active transportation among the elderly is always going to be a challenge. A 2011 study from a team of researchers led by Shinjiro Inyo at the Tokyo Medical University examined the walking habits of elderly people in Tokyo. Their research indicated that being in neighborhoods where other people remain, remained active and the general aesthetics of a community were actually indicators that elderly people would walk for both functional purposes, like going out to get groceries, or for recreation and exercise. Access to shops and general exercise facilities had a great benefit in encouraging walking. Organizations like the Ontario Professional Planners Institute the regulatory body for urban planners in Ontario have similarly called for improvements to streetscapes and the installation of more amenities to make walking seem like an enjoyable and viable alternative for the elderly. So this is where a concept like aging in place comes in. As Wiles et al. note, in the reading that was set for today, the meaning of aging in place for older people, aging in place is a term in aging policy that is defined as remaining living in the community with some level of independence rather than in residential care. This concept seeks to create policy and planning principles around our urban environments that reflect the fact that many individuals, as they grow old, want to remain in the homes that they've built for themselves over time. See, this gets back to what we were discussing earlier, namely how individuals are strongly driven by their habits. Habits can inform where we want to live based on what we're used to and what we've experienced in our childhood. But in our adulthood, as we come to find a place for ourselves, become established in our careers, form families if we so choose, form strong social ties with the individuals around us, we come to one of the fundamental things that we've been discussing in the second part of the class, which is to say that we form our identity in the urban environment, where we live, the place that we call home, our physical home, that place where we keep our art and host dinner parties, rest our heads at night, film online lectures. These are the places that matter to us and they help us define ourselves in relation to the urban environment around us. They help us express ourselves as a unique individual in the urban environment. People develop a very strong sense of attachment to their homes, particularly if they have been sites of incredible changes in their lives. This is why a significant number of older people choose to age in place. As the authors of the reading for today note, aging in place doesn't necessarily mean a specific home itself, but it can mean a larger neighborhood or a community. But in order for individuals to actually have the ability to age in place, we need to begin to change some of the aforementioned things. Our homes need to better reflect the fact that our mobility and our cognitive functioning will change as we get older, and we will need support 
in those homes. We will need to have amenities close, easy accessibility to doctors, shops within walking distance, community centers for us to continue to build those bonds and those ties that we had with individuals in our cohort and in our larger community. And our transportation network is going to have to recognize that not everyone will be able to drive for the entirety of their lives. Indeed, some choose to not drive now, and as they get older, the appeal of driving will just diminish further and further. So without significant changes to our urban environment, the entire concept of aging in place will be a very difficult one to tackle. Think back to what we learned about in the first part of the class, the way the urban environment is structured, how urban processes, how they're developed, and how the urban environment changes over time. Think about how for most of modern history, particularly in cities from the Industrial Revolution up until the present, they have been places for particular kinds of individuals. These are individuals with families, with careers, who are able to afford a car, who are able to afford a particular kind of accommodation. Other individuals, like youth and seniors, are often forced into accommodations or into situations that are not ideal for them. They adapt to the environment instead of having an environment built for them. It is an environment in which they are placed, but is built for entirely different groups of people. For younger individuals, such as ourselves, we more easily and readily adapt to these situations and these urban environments. But for individuals whose physical and cognitive capacities are diminished, or for individuals who have worked an incredibly long time and have done quite a bit to get to where they are, it can be very hard to ask them to suddenly shift the entirety of their lives because they no longer fit into the very narrow model of the urban environment that we've built. Ultimately, it's going to be up to policymakers, planners, architects, and other individuals participating in the design and the structuring of our urban environment in the future who will be the ones to decide if aging in place is an ideal toward which our society should strive. In the reading set for today, a number of respondents focused on some of the things we've discussed, like the nature of their housing, the amenities in their community, and the transportation networks that exist around those things. But as the authors note at the end of the paper, they also discuss the warmth and the strength of their community. Though it may seem easy to dismiss that as a romanticized notion of the neighborhood in which you live, it ties back to our identity and how we form an idea of who we are based on the places that we live. If we form identities around these places, and then for the last parts of our lives, we are expected to entirely shift that identity or forego living in the places that helped us forge our identity, who we are, and we haven't truly created urban environments for everybody. So, a brief recap of a very short lecture on just a few issues of the urban environment that impact people of different age groups. We've talked about what different generations there are in the city, how particular things like housing and access to amenities and transportation networks can impact how we experience the city, both from the perspective of young families, where they want to live, to youth, citing of particular things like skateboard parks and other amenities, and the elderly, the ease of walking through a community. And we concluded with a brief discussion about aging in place and the importance of building policy that works for everybody. So I know this was an incredibly short lecture on aging in place, but I don't want to overwhelm everyone or burden folks with too much information considering now our term has been all compressed and uh, this lecture is paired with the uh, with lecture 3A, Sexuality in the City. So I've got a whole bunch of different topics to cover. So hopefully this provides enough of a broad overview. The reading that was set for today and the readings that I'm gonna put at the end of this video, hopefully those will provide you with a lot more information. And hopefully you'll continue looking into the city and issues of aging as you go on. All right, so that's it for me. I hope everyone's enjoyed this lecture, and I hope you stay safe out there. All right, this is Chris Earl, signing off.
Researchers considering the issue of aging in the city have noted that there's one thing that always seems to confuse people. Nope. I'm confused. Blah.